Hello, everybody. Today is just a really, really cool day. Today is we're interviewing Paul Gibbs. He's the managing partner and owner of Extreme Technologies, Extreme Tank Technologies. My name is Stu Turley, president and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and we're about to have a lot of fun on this podcast. Hey, Paul, thank you for stopping by the podcast today. Thank you, Stuart, for uh, having me on. I'll tell you, I have really enjoyed getting to see your your work. Uh, we got introduced as a uh, from uh, Mark, and uh, it is really fun to see how your technology, as we go through this, is critical. Um, now, let's get started. Your cowboy hat is awesome. Uh, now that I've got Texas license plates, uh, tell us about your cowboy hat and how you got here. Cowboy hat, I bought it years ago. I grew up on a uh, ranch and farming and on the back of a horse, uh, grew up rodeoing. And so this is this is me. This is what you get right here. Uh, I grew up calf roping. Uh, later on, I team roped some, went off to college on a rodeo team. Uh, th so this is this is me. This is what I do. Uh, I went into working in the oil fields right after I graduated high school. I was going to college and had to work, you know. Uh, yep. Uh, feeding horses and feeding roping cattle and uh, going down entry phase and all, I had to have a job so I went to work in the oil field and uh, that's what, what I did. A and, rig hand? Uh, no sir. Uh, I actually w was a welder. Nice. And uh, I, I did the welding stuff for several years. I was coded and certified and all that and the old man who taught me how to weld one day he said you know I want you to look at something. He says you, you if you ever look at a welder they're never hungry but do they have what you want in life huh and i went hmm and i got the thought you know there's there's a better way to make a living so uh later on uh after i was in i was in a welding business had my own trucks and construction company uh i got offered a job to work for mobile oil company mobile exploration and production yep and uh i just got married and i thought well you know we'll be having kids they have insurance this is this is a route to go so I never looked back. I spent numerous years with them, and I was down whenever the this American came out with last one turning out last one here turned out the lights. When I was selling sour crude oil for seven dollars a barrel, so uh, that was back in the oh, early nineties. Um, uh, one of the downturns, you know, yep. and uh, that's when all the majors left here. Every major oil company in the permanent, you know, Shell, Mobil, Sh Chevron, Exxon you net golf they all left here and the buildings were vacant and it was hard to find a job and i was one of the lucky ones i went to work for fina oil and chemical company at the big spring refinery nice and i always thought well i'll work here until the oil field comes back well it took forever for the oil field to come back and <laughs> by that time i was moved up and i spent 25 years at the big spring refinery and uh so that's that's what I did. But when I was working for a mobile oil company, we had a, a tank battery that had no electricity to it. So every all the heater triggers were pneumatically dumped to the tanks. The water went to the water tank, oil went to the oil tank, and, and it kept on messing up. And we kept on putting oil the into the water tank. I mean, yeah, oil into the water tanks. And so we're constantly having hire trucks come out there and take the water off the tank. And then once we got to the oil, take the oil and put it back into, into the oil tank. Well, the truck drivers were, they weren't, they weren't paying attention. They would, they would take a half a load of oil to the, so, to a disposal site and get a free pocket knife, you know? Right. So there'd be 50, 60 barrels of oil gone. And so uh, I thought, you know, there, there's a way to solve this. And so I came up with my original patent in 1990 and it was an oil skimmer. And it, it was a floating oil skimmer. It didn't matter what level you were at. You could, my suction point was at the top of the liquid in the tank. And we just used a pump and we could suck from the top down. And that thing was, was magic. It worked great. And so we started putting in them in salt water. We were a secondary recovery field. We used water to inject into the ground for secondary recovery. We had lots of water. So it was always carryover. So we would um, put Paul, just let's back up a little bit on that. Cause if you're talking about the tanks with the floating lids, 
and you're talking about the pontoons as they come around is that the device that you're talking about or what kind of device are you talking about just because oh. i want our listeners to understand that part of okay. it these these are not floating roof tanks these are fixed roof tanks Tank okay got it like, like okay, oil great. producers have we were mobile exploration and production was a was an oil producer we were drilling wells and growing the tank batteries with it oh. and so we started putting all these in, in different water tanks and and we actually put them in we they had built a brand new they they had rebuilt a brand new our uh, old water station made everything new and up to date had uh in them days it's pecan filtration these pecan oils to filter the water and anyway they had all kinds of skimming devices on the tanks and it's supposed to remove all the oil and a boss of mine i just had a really good boss he said hey let's put one in down here while the tanks are new even though it's got skimmers on, let's see what we can do. So we did, and we put it in the last tank. That, we put it in the tank that was feeding the triplex pumps. We had six great big, like a four and a quarter inch plunger triplex pumps that were running and pushing water into the ground. And um, we ran that line that we were taking the oil off of to a tank battery, it wasn't but 200 yards away. And we put it in the pumpers manifold and that way we could measure it when we wanted to to find out what the oil and water cut was and how much it was and we all took guesses you know would it be a half a barrel a day a quarter barrel a day because this this water flux station had brand new everything on it we wound up being between 11 and 13 barrels a day average oil getting off them tanks no these way were, these were stripper wells making about 10 15 barrels a day so it's like we added an oil well out there and it was a you know and that's when wow. That's when a lot of a lot of people went, wow, there's there's something here, you know. Uh, well, it wasn't long after that, the this is probably 91, 92, that mobile put everything they had up for sale. And I wound up without a job and uh, I basically put the patent in a literally in a shoebox underneath my bed. No kidding. And for years it sat there. And um, I went to work for a, a refinery. Totally different, totally different horse to ride versus oil production. Right. And um, I spent several years just learning. Uh, and I, I wound up being the guy running the units uh, for the last 10 or 15 years I was there. Uh, I ran the board, I ran atmospheric distillation, vacuum distillation, reformation, naphtha how to treat and propane to asphalt. When it came to taking crude oil and heating it up and just turning it to vapor, you know, that's something that was my wheelhouse. Right. I had this tool that I had invented that was a skimmer, and I kept on thinking, you know, and in 1990, when I invented this, we'd never heard of volatile organic compounds, melting ice glaciers. Um, right. The infrared camera wasn't out, but around 2000, when the infrared camera came out, so when I started seeing video of these tanks i've been around my whole life and i went oh good lord you know i knew it was, there was h2s there i was always cautious but even just pulling up to them tanks there, there's gas just blowing out everywhere right uh, it, it kind of makes you wonder you know what have i done to myself so i knew that vapor recovery was invented around 1946 and nothing's really changed right when you're taking suction off a fixed roof tank uh you you have a compressor that if it pressures up to four ounces, it comes on, if it shuts off at one ounce, when it gets pumped down to one ounce, it shuts off. I knew that nothing had really changed. And I knew that we weren't doing it right. And that's when and how I came up with, I have this tool that's in the tank. Why don't I take suction internally inside the tank where all the action is? Right. And the world of distillation, when I heat crude all up to 685 degrees, and I put it into a distillation tower, 70% of it turns to vapor, West Texas Intermediate Crew. 70% will go to vapor. That's where all the action is taking place. That's called the flash zone in that tower where the oil enters it. In a tank, right above your liquid level, that's your flash zone. That's where all the gases are coming out. Oil's been underneath the ground, 8,000 foot down there for, I don't know how many hundred millions of years. Right. You've got four, 4,000 pounds of pressure on it. We bring it to the surface. We put it into a tank that's atmospheric. It's going to breathe like crazy. And, and oh. what it's breathing are gases. Yep. The traditional way, the way we do it today, if, if the office that you're in, picture, picture your office, the room that you're in being inside of the tank, the floor where your feet are, that's the oil level. 
Right. When the gases flash up and they rise up and they have to go to your ceiling of your office, yep. they don't all get there. There's different gases. There's C8, C7, C6, C5, C4s. Right. They will condense. On their way up, it takes energy. They condense back to a liquid, go back to the tank's liquid. They will hit the wall of the tank or, or the wall of your office. They right. form a droplet. They'll go back to a liquid. They'll fall back down. They'll hit your ceiling to try yep. to find a four-inch opening. They form a droplet. That's an obstruction. In the gas business, we call it a demister pad. When a, when a gas molecule hits a solid mass, that roof is there to dry gas out and make it turn back to liquid. It falls back down. Now, all your oil people will say, well, I'd rather have it as a liquid. It's, it's a better price. Right. But that's a volatile organic compound. It's not going to remain a liquid. It's going to flash again. And what happens is, is their cousins show up because more oil comes in. You have more of these heavy molecules coming in. Your tank goes up to four ounces and you pump it off the one. It keeps on doing this. You've built a trend of four and one, four and one. A lot of these heavy molecules show up and they flash just like it. You go to 12 ounces. Your tank, your compressor is out there and running. Why is my tank? Everybody thinks, oh, I got bad Nardo valves. I got bad thief hatches. They'll send crews out there. And they only leak for 90 seconds or 120 seconds, but that's out of compliance. You're leaking. The problem is, is you did not remove the molecules that were flashing when you're pulling off the roof of your tank. Wow. Back where I said where your feet were is your oil level. That's where I'm taking suction. Internal yeah. inside the tank, right above the oil level. I don't allow anything to build. I don't allow heavy molecules to remain in the tank. If they flash, I remove it. It's total carbon capture. Removing the flash points is critical then. The flash point is the area that we're working in. And if it flashes, we remove it. We don't, we don't allow it to travel. If I have a 25 foot tall tank and a 10 foot nice. level, it's got to travel 15 foot. Right. And then it's got to hit a roof, find its way out of four inch opening, go up two more foot out of a four inch pipe and turn and go down to a compressor. Let me put it to you this way. It's 685 degrees in a distillation tower. Right. 40 foot up, I start condensing. Atmospheric gas oil. It's yeah. 685 degrees. 40 foot up from there is diesel. 40 foot up from there is kerosene. 40 foot up from there is jet fuel. What makes it out the top is what we call light naphtha, or it's the base of gasoline. Wow. Everything else, jet fuel didn't even make it out the top of the, of the tower. Kerosene didn't make it out. Diesel didn't make it out. Atmospheric gas oil didn't make it out. That's your heavier molecules. As they traveled up, they condensed and became what they became, uh, whatever that sea was. And so uh, the same thing happens in your tank. If I have to travel up, I'm sure not at 685 degrees. I'm at 100 degrees or 140 degrees or 60 degrees. Right. Uh, it's sure not going to travel up and get out of the tank. I stabilize. I don't allow the tanks to leak anymore because I, if it flashes, I remove it. Total carbon capture upon, upon release of the vapor. When you talk carbon capture, and I've always said there's no ESG if you have no accountability. Can people take a look at your equipment from extreme tank technologies and you can measure how much CO2 and how much stuff you're pulling off? Oh, of yeah. your, because that's critical. If you have accountability, those oil companies can say, we got true you know, ESG or we can actually do this. Yeah. We, we catch a bomb, which is, which is a sample of vapor. They call right. it a bomb. It kind of looks like a football. Um, and we take it to a lab and do a GC analysis and they'll break it down how much oxygen, nitrogen, methane, pentane, propane, butane, uh, the list goes on. They break it down to everything. They'll tell you the heating value or the BTU value. I'll tell you what we did is we spent a year, we did a test study for a year. We, had a, we went to a tank battery, it had two oil tanks. They were coming off the roof. So we, we left one tank off the roof and we put our tool in the other tank. You can't get more apples to apples than that. Same oil, same elevation, same temperature, same everything. Right. We would run four hours off the roof or six hours off the roof. We, we even had 
Battelle Engineering, which is your largest research engineering firm in the United States, coming in the middle of third party testing. We came off the roof the traditional way. That heating value was 1186. We swapped over, put the oil production into the tank that had the extreme tool. Right. It went up, it went up 10%. It was 1,394 or something. I can't remember, but it was exactly 10%. It's actually a little bit over 10% increase in heating value in BTUs. Wow. Which tells you I'm capturing a heavy molecule that the world is not today. Because yeah. the higher the BTU, is the wetter the gas, is the heavier the molecule. Right. We actually look at the rates per barrel. How many standard cubic foot of gas did we pump per barrel? There's about an 18% gain. So uh, on the other example that you had, uh, you increase almost, you know, I don't want to use the word double, but you have an extra uh, X number factor of increasing barrels and quality product coming out of your tanks. Is that a fair statement then? Not only getting the, the capturing of the gases and stuff, you're actually making a better product for people to pull off. Yeah, there, there's a number of issues with, with the liquids. There's a thing called RVP, read vapor pressure. And that is a measurement of gases that are tied up in your crude oil. Right. And in the wintertime, it really becomes an issue. There, there's two knobs you can use in the world of distillation, pressure and temperature. Right. Well, these tanks are at four, six, eight ounces. That's about all the pressure you're going to hold on. So pressure is really not a deal. So you have to use temperature to, to heat the oil up to get it to release the gas. Well, if a tank is built right, and if the companies haven't broke engineering standard, they will have a they will have an internally they'll have a downcomer or a pipe coming all the way down and releasing the oil at the bottom of the tank. Hmm. A lot of companies, because of RVP, have gone up there and cut inside that tank and cut that pipe off. The problem with that is, is you took a, an engineering standard, you tore it up and threw it away. That pipe is in there for a purpose. It comes in and it goes to about six inches. Yep. or four inches before it stops at the bottom of the tank. Once I sell my tank of oil, I'm compl I've gone on air. I still have 10 inches in it. It's called, it's called a heel on the tank. The reason is that pipe never, that pipe never not touches liquid. It right. must always touch liquid. Uh, that downcomer that's putting your oil in your tank. If I go in there and cut it off and I'm releasing any kind of liquid, water, oil, I don't care what it is. Right. It's going across the atmosphere, which is a positive displacement of protons and neutrons. It's building static charge. Right. Your tanks will catch on fire. If they have oxygen in them, they will blow up. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter it's of when. Right. Do not be going and cutting that pipe off. And if you want to solve RVP, my tool does it. I'll explain how. This is one of the many processes it does. Your, your tool uh, in your uh, material you sent over actually has even the fire suppression system. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. This is really cool. We yeah. talk about oil. You, you see the oil tanks on fire, and that's a disaster. Tell us about how your system will suppress the fire. Well, when you talk about fire, there's not a more helpless feeling than sit there and watching your tank battery burn up. <laughs> Unless, uh, yeah, unless your uh, truck is right next to it. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's not a more helpless feeling. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's on fire. All you can do is get on your phone and call and ask for help. There's a lot of volunteer fire departments in this area that's came out with a, a letter saying, we're not there for the tank fires. We're right. there for the surrounding area of livestock and, and grasslands. Right. They're not going to risk themselves. For starters, if my tool is in there, right. all the oil company has to do is run an inch and a half line a football field away. Right. And from a football field away, that fire truck can show up a football. They don't mind showing up a football field away. And they can get off their truck and tie one hose on their discharge and hook it up to that inch and a half line. And it'll pump in that line. It'll come around and it goes internally inside that tank. And it's released where I'm taking the gas out. Now I filled it up with fire foam and it's releasing the fire foam internally inside the tank. No way. 
The fire foam does not travel through temperature. This is the only fire tool that this is occurs. A uh, fire foam does not travel through the 1800 to 2400 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, right. Zero pin asphalt from 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, fire foam is 97% water and 3% foam added to it. Water boils at 212 degrees. But where you were at, 16, 18, 2000, whatever, you're way above that standard. So as I put my fire foam in, and it lands in there. A, I'm splashing. I can. I'm getting oil and splashing oil up and out. If the roof is gone, right now. Also, I'm going through this flames, destroying my foam's efficiency. Average twenty thirty percent is your general average of foam once it reaches a hot spot inside that tank. Right. I'm one hundred percent exponentially. I put out tank fires, but faster because. What I'll send in there is I'm making 100 on my math test, or you can go make a 20 or 30 on your math test. That's how it works. So extreme tank technologies is the red adair of tank uh, fire suppression. There you go. Uh, what we do is we set up, and we don't particularly have any camera. We're not in the camera business. You can pick what you want, but there's 100 kind of cameras out there that are heat detection and flame detection, and there's right. infrareds that will pick it up too. But it, 10 30 at nine the thunderstorm builds up and lightning hits your tank and it's on fire in right. less than one second that camera will detect it we have stored pre-mixed fire foam on site think of a propane tank it's pressurized we'll have nitrogen bottles pushing all 300 400 450 pounds on wow. this vessel and it has one valve it's already pre-mixed there's there's no we got to do this first we got to do that first when that camera says fire a solenoid opens one valve. I got 350 pounds on this side. I got four ounces on this side. So there it goes. It fills up that line and goes inside that tank. It's it's designed to develop. It's releasing. It. You can go on my website. You can look it up. I, I go to the gallery. There's a videos of it putting out tank fires. Um, 360 degree release of fire foam. I, I use the best fire foam I can find. I'm, I'm even looking right now at a plant-based fire foam. Fire foam is killing firemen. I don't know if you know this, but firemen are dying of cancer left and right because they were putting chemicals in fire foam that was right. carcinogenic, real high carcinogenics. And so they had to take that, that product out. Right. Well, they've never been able to duplicate the efficiency of the fire foam. Right. And that's something else that made my tool so much better. My tool lays it in there so smooth, there's no splash. Every gallon I send there shows up there. If I'm out here in West Texas, here in the Permian Basin, right? we don't get storms very often, but when we do, they're always violent storms. Right. If the roof is blown off, for starters, the, the, the fire company, the firemen will show up you know, straight up and over. Well, there's always wind blowing. So 60% makes it into the tank. The other 40% blows out into the pasture. Right. With my tool, every gallon that's in that tank shows up in, the, in that pressurized, we call it a cap unit, compressed air foam systems. Every gallon that's in there shows up inside the oil tank. There's wind does not carry it. We're, we're, we're putting it through containment. My tool is all 316 stainless. It's designed for heat. It won't. It'll have to, it, it has to get another eight or 900 degrees hotter to melt it, before, and the, but the tank is already a puddle of, puddle of metal. Nice. Uh, we're, we're a thousand degrees higher on melt versus the, the, the carbon steel tank. Right. Um, we're there for the H2S, we're there for the chlorides, we're there to last. Um, that, that, that carcinogen is, is terrible for the, the firefighters. And the volunteer firefighters out there trying to yes. handle something local like that. Yes. How how is the plant base um, coming in? Is that looking good right now? <sighs> well, uh, I, I, I'm trying to. I'm going to bring them on and, and be part of the you know part of the solution. That's what you'll nice. have to think uh, to fight the fire that way. If your people ever get around it, here's what you can do. You can actually drink the stuff. Now, I'm sure it tastes horrible <laughs> but it's not going to hurt i mean it's kind of like drinking uh you know uh i don't know 
My but wife's exactly, cooking. Yeah, it's 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 horrible. I'm sure, but you can raise it's all plant based. But I'll tell you this: the fire chief, the head fire chief of the state of Florida. Right. I watched that they went and demonstrated to the state of Florida. This nice. certain company did, and the fire chief said, "He says I've been doing this for I don't know thirty years. I've yep. never been more impressed in my life." And he says, "I was the guy on the fire hose," and he said, "I nice. can't believe." I tell you what they did: they took a wood pallet, leaned it up against a a metal fence, they soaked it in gasoline, and they lit it. And this this fire chief gets an inch and a half hose and spray, and he he sprays and puts it out. Right? They go back and pour gasoline back on the pallet. Right. They, the fire chief can't light it with a, with a with a with a pair burner torch. No way. It's that now, good. Now on the ground, he could light it on the ground where 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 it had no foam. Yeah. Where the gasoline had spilled on the ground when they were spraying it down, he could light that gasoline. Wow. Proving that it was gasoline, but he could not light that pallet. And I've then I've seen them on oh 50,000 barrel size tanks. Right. They're just using an inch and a half hose. This tank is completely on fire. They're just using a one inch and a half hose on the ground and he sprays it up there for 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Wow. That, tank, that size of tank out. It doesn't take, take depth. When you're dealing with fire foam, you want to put it, it's kind of like shaving cream. That's, that's why right. I tell you, go get, a, go get a can of, the self-contained fire foam expands. You can get spent right. 20 to 1, 30 to 1. For every gallon, it expands to 30 gallons or 20 gallons, depending on your mixture. It's kind of like getting a can of uh, Barbasol shave cream, and, and brand new can, and go into your bathroom sink and start spraying. That little can will fill up your kitchen or your bathroom sink. You know? Right. Uh, but that's the kind of theory behind that. And you want depth. Well, this, this plant-based stuff, it does not. It, it's... I just let the videos. You know, they, this is exciting. Up to the point, but so you know, and and so when you take a look at all the safety issues that we have just talked about, you know, ESG is nothing without accountability. You got the accountability, you got the safety factors in there. Um, I, I'm enjoying getting my uh, Mr. Science lesson in here with everything that you've been talking on on this. That you've got some real world experience putting all this together. Yeah. Uh, that's that's from getting up at three thirty every morning, being at work, from hour drive at, at four forty five. You know, so. Oh, you bet. I, I mean, this real world experience in your patent. So, when you also talk about uh, some of the clients and potential clients, we're talking also the floating tanks as well too, because you have part of your. Explain how some of that would work, because we also have you know like Mark and other folks that would be Bitcoin miners. Right. And and how would you pull the uh, methane gas off of that so that you could burn that in a uh, and generate electricity? Sure. Uh, there's there's two different business models. There's actually three okay. different business models for for, for for what I do. One is I go into fixed roof tanks. The majority of those are oil producers, guys who are drilling oil and coming to a tank battery. You will see some fixed roof tanks in refineries and in tank farms, but the majority of those tanks are floating roof tanks. Right. That's an, another aspect. And I'll tell you another one that, and this is cool, tequila, bourbon, rum, um, all your spirits. Right. I had a guy call me up from Mexico. He has a high-end tequila manufacturing plant and if you think about it you know tequila will burn and that oh, was his yeah. main concern was was with fire his tequila plant was in, he told me what town i've already forgotten now but he said i'm on the corner and all, all these bars are up and down the street and at night time there's people walking and everybody's smoking well his tanks they're like 210 barrel size tanks and he's got like 10 of them and only thing separating the tank from people walking is, is a center block fence it's six seven eight foot tall but the tanks are 15 16 foot tall and there's vapors coming off of them oh my goodness this and is he a disaster said, he, he said he said i saw you, what you do and how you do it and so we're in talks with them about setting up a fire system for them and and uh how because, fun uh that, that that's another business i'm going to do but it, i mean anyway let me get back to the floating roofs on, on a float roof tank 
how that works is, is uh, the tanks in turn, inside the tank, there's a there's actual floating steel roof or aluminum roof that floats up and down. The liquid hits it and picks it up. Right. And it, and it floats. Because of the hydrostatic pressure that this roof, because it's laying on top of oil. Right. For decades, they said, well, that's 98% efficient. That's good enough. But when the infrared camera came out, they kind of went, uh, yeah, it's not 98. Mm, yeah. Matter of fact, I, I'm working with the California, I can't think of their abbreviation, their, their acronym, but it's, it's, it's their state emissions, air emissions people. Right. And uh, they came out with, with new studies that are saying that a fixed roof tank with vapor recovery, standard vapor recovery is much better than a just than a floating roof tank, and they, that's that that flipped the what they used to think. And but anyway, I go into floating roof tanks. If it the majority of them on the outside diameter, that's where the seal is and where the pontoons are. Right. There's a small area, but there's a vapor space. Sometimes well, it could be twenty inches of vapor space in height. Right. I attach my tool to the bottom side of that roof. Okay. Now, if this is a if this is a big tank, let's say it's a half a million barrels. It's three hundred and twenty foot across it. The square footage of that is enormous. It's right. it's it would be two football fields side by side. It'd be a football field long and a football you know field wide. So the square footage is enormous. Um, so you picture a clock on a wall. Twelve o'clock, I would have a tool underneath the roof inside of it. At one right. o'clock, I'd have a tool. Two o'clock, so I'd have twelve tools in this in this right. tank, and its job is we would either have a compressor or, or, or some kind of mechanism taking a pull and removing the vapors twenty four seven. That way they don't leak. If you go and put a camera on any of these roofs, I'm going to say in a twenty four hour period, eighty a high eighty percent of them are going to leak at some point. So they're, they're not sealed off perfect. There's an eighth of an inch gap all the way around them for starters. Um, this is crazy. Uh, I see so you're, you're talking like, let's take Cushing, Oklahoma. Yep. Uh, there is a bazillion tanks in Cushing, Oklahoma. A bazillion, yes, you're right. I mean, that's that's just one Texas way to call them, a bazillion. Yeah, you're tanks. right. There's a, and think how much, I mean, barrels of oil is there. You bet. I mean, there's, I can't, I don't even remember, but it's all the pipelines coming in from everywhere and kind of congregating there and having a cup of coffee before they head out. Yep. But you're, you're sitting there thinking that's gotta be some really bad uh, odors coming off in, in uh, methane coming out of that whole pollution gig up there. Yeah. Well, you know, the good, the good part about it is are 50 to 60 foot tall on most of them tanks. And so we don't, we're not really getting, unless it's a cloudy, cloudy day, you know? Right. Um, and, and, but the floating roof tanks, I told you I was working with the California air quality people. They right. did a case study and it was on a large refinery in California. I'm pretty sure I don't know what refinery it is, but they didn't tell me. But anyway, it's a large refinery. They set up, all, they set up millions of dollars worth of equipment all on all four sides of the property. And they measured everything. Right everything for a year uh, 53 percent of the emissions in a refinery come from the tank farm from the tanks say that again 53 percent 53 percent from the tanks from the right. tank farm we, they call them tank when we have all your tanks out there they call it the tank farm right uh, uh 53 percent of all their emissions came from their tanks the other 47 percent that didn't come from the tanks, the majority of that was CO2 coming off the stacks, the heaters. Wow. Well, they, they can always go in there. We, we, we've been capturing CO2 off the heaters for a while now. Right. Uh, so that's something they can go in there and fix. The the minute bit left over was a control valve, the, 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 the packing in a control valve was leaking or a, a valve cap on a compressor, you know, um, a, a a packing in a, in a in a in a valve or somewhere, you know, right. something you can go and tighten up or repack and, and fix. Uh, and, and that's what Eldar is about: leak detection and repair. So, uh, but they can 
there is no LDR for tanks. Right. You can you can see them leak, but there's nobody to go fix it right quick. You know. No, uh, I'll tell you this is absolutely some of the most encouraging things I've heard about getting rid of methane uh, and helping the oil and gas uh, reputation. You know, because we're always getting uh, slammed uh, for CO2 and, and all those kind of things. This is something easily that uh, we could implement yes. as an industry and take 50%, like you just said, 50% of a, a problem away. That's huge. Yes. When it comes to your, your, your oil producers, your tank batteries, I can actually go in and retrofit the tool in and not do hot work on the tank. I don't have I don't have to have the tank killed to weld on it. In other words, I wow. can show up, I show up. There's a manway door. I show up with a new man, manway door that has the connections already welded in it, and it's already plastic coated on the inside. I right. take their old door off, put the tool in, hook it up to the door inside of the door, put the door on, put some valves on. They can have their tank back. You can spin them up, hooking the compressors up and the fire lines up, and you know, but they can be using their tank. I take the old manway door that I took off and I go and weld connections in it and we show up for the next tank. So they'll invest in some new new doors from if their tank doors are the same. And you know, uh, most of all of them, if, if they're not the same, you got three or four of a kind around there somewhere. And so right. you can always just keep on moving forward. Um, but how the Bitcoin people come into this is of course I'm capturing gases. We're going through, we're bringing the gases out. We're going to go through gen sets, generators, gas, natural gas burning engines that are cranking a generator, making electricity. Right. The Bitcoin people want to get off of the grid. Uh, right. you know, in Texas, 13 months ago, when the grid failed, failed on us, oh. they said, you know, 200 some odd people died. I, I think the numbers were probably higher than that, but uh, yep. uh, that's, that's, the, we'll never know. Uh, Here's what we can do. We could be making Bitcoin. And if another storm like that hits, we shut down the Bitcoin mining for those 10 days. We put the electricity into the grid. Exactly. That's uh, not a bad backup system. Not a bad backup system. Uh, a refinery or a tank. So let's say a refinery. Let's say uh, okay. Exxon Mobil's Bay, Baytown refinery. They have a big refinery there. Uh, Beaumont. Maybe it's the Beaumont refinery. Anyway. If I went in there and put this in every tank they had, the amount of electricity we could make is astronomical, which would be a, they could take that electricity and they could be self-sufficient. They don't have to worry about an 18 wheeler three miles down the road that had a wreck and knocked out a transformer bank and knocked them offline or a hurricane coming in and they have no electricity for a month. Uh, they could be self-sufficient. You know, having this system would have a return on investment for these big companies uh, very quick. I mean, uh, just being able to say, let's put it on a tank. Let's run our own power off of this. Holy smokes. I mean, the ROI on this thing and ESG carbon uh, reduction uh, and also turning it to, to energy. And then when they bring in the Bitcoin mining, you can then now have another resource. So I'm sitting here counting about five major reasons, and then you have the fire suppression. Uh, I'm I'm not hearing anything that's bad about this. Stuart, we did we did some ROI, some some math back oh year and a half ago when natural gas was two fifty two seventy five. Right, and there wasn't a place, for example, a refinery that wouldn't pay itself back in less than 18 months. Anything under three years in, in business is fabulous, but 18 months at $2? $2.50 was the, was the price of natural gas then. And we're 420 something? Or uh, I, think, I think we're 485. 485. Yeah. Boy, uh, so I can do some, I, I did go to Oklahoma State University, so I, but I now have Texas uh, license plates. So, you know, don't hold that against me, but I can count here. <laughs> yeah. Oklahoma State University, uh, they were, y'all were the smart, smart enough people to keep boom pickings around where Texas A&M let him go after his first year. Oh, how funny. Uh, 
He's an interesting cat. And I'll tell you, he's donated a lot to OSU. Oh, yeah. That's what they call a big mistake. He went to AM for one year and then they dropped the scholarship and he wound up at Oklahoma State. Wow. Uh, he's given them over a billion dollars, I think, or, or set up in trust fund or a, in a yeah. investment fund. So, yeah, that was a big mistake there. Yeah. Uh, Coach Gundy was there when I was there and uh, I was tutoring some of the other football players and stuff. So, um, I, I have a, uh, affinity for, uh, coach Gundy and, and the whole team. So. Yeah. That's a very unique football field too. The sidelines are about, I mean, from the, from the out, out of bound lines to the stands is about that wide, you know, you, you uh, it, it's, they got it full of seats. They believe in. Well, I'll tell you what though, we, we almost made it. we missed, we lost the big 12 championship by this much. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, college football is my thing. Uh, that and, and baseball, but uh, I, I like. Well, I, I'm baseball. I've kind of slowed down on and got more into college football. But uh, yeah. the SEC, yeah. the South, or I call it still called South, the Big Twelve. Uh, those are the two main yep. ones I watch. Is right there. And speaking of SEC, did you know that I, I just read it a while ago? The SEC today has yep. come out, not the Southeast Conference, but the government sec right. and they're going to ask all companies to write down uh, they're going to have a form for them i guess all of their greenhouse gas emissions all their esgs everything they're going to hold them accountable and and that way investors can look at it well you know that that you know that almost goes right into what i just said earlier on this uh, uh talk here paul with you paul there is no ESG without accountability. Now, I'm not a fan of regulations. A, I'm not a fan of politicians. B, and I'm not a fan of uh, useless regulations that stop uh, low-cost energy getting to everybody. Right. But if they do say that and they say it's actually good regulations, I'm all, I'm all in. But on the other hand, you know, if they're going to just throw all these regulations in there, people are going to need extreme tank technologies in order to verify that they're doing these things. Right. And of course, you can meter this. And uh, what, what the, the area I want to get to is, is I want to go in. This is in, this is in our near future. I, hope. I want to go in to XYZ oil company. Right. And say, all right, you're drilling. You got a big drilling program going. You're out here in a Delaware basin, let's say, and you got to put a gas line in from this tank battery. That this is your infrastructure. You got to take care of water, gas, and oil. You got to put a gas line in to a big trunk line heading to a gas plant. Well, a these gas plants out there, they're all full. I mean, right. it's not like they're begging for gas. There's plenty of it out there, so they're all full. They're not giving market price for it if it's at four dollars 95 cents they might give you two dollars for it because wow. they're just they're not they're not needing it that bad they're full if i have to if i have to lay a line a three or four inch line i don't know 11 miles and go through four different landowners and you know this one guy doesn't want it so i gotta go around this way i'll tell you what just keep that money for your drilling program we will buy all your gas and that's what we offer today with the Bitcoin people. We will buy all your gas on a five-year contract. Now you can go and you can hedge because you got a five-year contract on gas. And, oh, you didn't have to spend, I don't know, $1.1 million for a gas line. You didn't have to wait nine months for the drilling rig to show up because you couldn't get rid of that gas line in yet. We'll just go ahead. We're going to take care of the gas. Um, we're even bringing in more new technology. It's not mine, where we want to take the exhaust off of these generators. Right. Of course, you have to permit these generators, right? Um, we want to take the exhaust, and this new te other new technology is we're making direct contact with produced water, the water that's coming out of that oil well. Right. We're making direct contact with that produced water, and depending on the total dissolved solids, what that number is, we can we'll evaporate up to sixty percent of that water. Huh. Now where I live, the seismic activity is getting bad. Four point right. seven the other day, my dishes in my house rattled. My my wife come running in here going, "What?" Is, and she's the first thing she said to me was, "What did you do?" 
<laughs> I'm like, uh, I didn't do anything. I'm sitting in the chair watching the footstones, you know. I don't know. I didn't do anything. <laughs> and it, it scared me too. But uh, um, sounds like getting, my wife. They're getting more and more. We, we've had four a day uh, that you can feel. And um, the water's the problem. So if we can, if we can go in there and take care of 40, 50, percent of the water right. and reduce it what it also does it changes the permitting on the exhaust of these of, of these of these uh machines that are making electricity it's actually making direct contact with the water right it helps you on your so2s and even on your NOx. uh what we would like to do we can even add uh, ammonia to it and we want to get this as low as possible uh, we don't have, we're not, we're not there. We're in the environmental business. I know I have a lot of environmental companies out there, but I'm in the environmental business making a major impact. Well, absolutely. Everything I've seen in your documentation, you sent over and everything else. I'm, I'm a skeptic on most things. This is phenomenal. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, I, I cannot wait to take you out to dinner and, uh, next time I'm in Midland and, uh, fortunately, uh, at extreme tank technologies.com, I'm saying that for our folks that are just listening, but for our folks that this publishes out on energy Newsbeat, we'll have all of your information, uh, all of your, the way to contact you. Because uh, this, I'll tell you what, Paul, I have really enjoyed this conversation. Not only is it, it's encouraging because the oil and gas industry has been taking it uh, uh, in the back of the head so hard that our eyeballs have popped out, you know, and it's not the truth. This, uh, now, I, Paul, I have to admit, we've not always done it right in the oil and gas space. And, and now, you know, Texas was really ahead of the curve in reducing their flaring, you know, ahead of the regular, you know, they were really starting to get better at it. But now with this technology of flaring all of a sudden Bitcoin coming in, it's really, you don't, there's no reason to have to flare gas anymore. That is true. With companies like you coming in and saying, Hey, we'll take your gas. That's pretty darn cool. Right. There, there's a saying we have here. Uh, you're right about, about you know we got to do better right we have to do better and this is a, this is a way to be if we don't do better there the government comes in and regulates us just think about that red i'll tell people think about that red plastic gas can that we go to walmart and buy and it oh, has yeah. that spout on it have you figured out yet how to get that we don't know I, I got a funnel is what i use and I, and I don't put the spout on it i just pour it with a, with a funnel it's the biggest it makes the biggest mess in the world i want it with gasoline all over me all over everything i'm doing and they call that safety. Oh, no. Uh, it's worse. Factor. I uh, just I'll, shoot me. I tell people, this is, this, is how, this, is how, this is how the real world is. Yep. They are removing what makes it out of the tank. I'm removing everything that flashes in the tank. Wow. That's the difference. That's as simple as I can put it. I make every tank a three-phase separator. There's a million other things we can do. And, and the saltwater disposal business. Right. I can remove all the oil and I never hire a truck again to remove the oil. I can purge it. I have a compressor there that has a nitrogen membrane on it that they can rent. We put nitrogen in. We push all the oxygen out, push all the methane and gases out. Wow. You have inert atmosphere and you have no oil there. Lightning can hit it all day long. It's hard to burn water in nitrogen. Wow. I'll tell you what, Paul, uh, again, I can't wait to have you back as well as uh, visiting with Mark Lancaster. We're going to go through the, the Bitcoin as well. But I'll tell you, uh, we've got about two more minutes. What's on the coming around the corner for Extreme Tank Technologies? What do you got coming up? Well, we got several projects coming up, but the, 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 where I want to get to, I, I had mentioned this to you earlier, where I want to get to is I want to go to company XYZ. I want to take the emissions off of their books. Right. Them online. I want to take care of it for them. They have their carbon footprint is one away. That's our business. That's what we now, do. Say that again, because that's really important. And yeah. we're talking companies like Shell, uh, BP, uh, Conoco, and any of those, right? Right. 
I want to take the missions off of their books and put it on your yours and put them on mine. Now that's still their tanks. Uh, there, there, there's no, that's still their oil. If right. Their oil runs over. That's their mess to pick up. Uh, but as far as the carbon footprint goes, that's mine. We take care of that. We have the wow. tools. That, that's how much we believe in. Uh, that's how much I believe in what I have here. I've seen it. I've been, I've had this in tanks since 1990 and the worst applications you can think of uh, produce water that's circulating for for a, for a secondary recovery it was in there for 21 years they tore the tank down to rebuild the tank it was still working after 21 years in the saltiest h2s harshest environment you can imagine wow. uh, it was pitted it looked like it had been through a war or two but it was still working after so 21 we're, years. we're talking oxy pioneer we're talking any of these folks need to talk to you like yesterday yes wow if you're serious about esg you need to talk to me if, right if, you know, there's people who want to play with the books i'm not that guy i'm a guy that has answers i'll tell you what that this is cool i get fired up i'm about ready to just run down the road to midland uh, i get so excited <laughs> talking to you so um, I'll tell you what, thank you very much, Paul, for stopping by the podcast. And again, we're going to have all of your information in the show notes, how to get a hold of you, and uh, we'll make sure that you uh, get blasted out there. So again, thank you, thank you very much, Paul. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you.